Okay, greetings everyone, Pastor Brett here, and I'm just going to do a video in response to a comment. Uh, I did a video uh, a few months back, uh, most of you would remember, on uh, cessation versus continuation, um, and then I did a follow-up video on the gifts of the Spirit, um, coming to you from First uh, Corinthians 13. Uh, and uh, with First uh, Corinthians 13, um, we spoke about uh, the, um, the uh, cessation of the gifts of the Spirit um, from the perspective of well, when the perfect comes. And uh, so uh, I'll, I'll read uh, uh, the text again. And then after I read the text, um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about this. I'll answer this question and we'll see um, how far we can get within this short time span that I have here. Uh, the text is uh, um, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I'll be reading it to you from the King James Version, uh, but we'll... Uh, We'll do a little, uh, uh, little Greek study here as well. First uh, Corinthians 13, and the Apostle Paul um, shares these words with us. Uh, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. So prophecies will fail. According to what the Apostle Paul was saying there, He's saying that prophecies will fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Uh, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. My reasoning there was quite simple. When you read it and you see the natural progression of the verse there, you see that uh, prophecies will fail, tongues will cease, and knowledge will vanish away. So to the cessationist, I say, my argument is simply this, and it is that if prophecies are going to fail and tongues are going to cease, then the natural progression demands that knowledge will vanish away. Now, we know that this is knowledge. The Word of God is knowledge. And if you say that the gifts of the Spirit are going to cease, then this gift as well has ceased. Because um, I say that prophecy has not vanished, uh, prophecy has not failed, tongues have not ceased, and knowledge most certainly has not vanished away. Um, the spirit of prophecy is the Holy Spirit. Amen? So how can you say that prophecies cease? Um, a prophetic utterance is simply a prediction of the future. That's simple. Uh, the Holy Spirit has given me, on numerous occasions, visions in a dream that were for either myself as a warning of impending danger or for someone else as a message to them to get them to a place of repentance, to bring them to close to Christ. Uh, and so... Um, that's prophetic in and of itself. Uh, when you talk about prophecy regarding some new word, some new revelation, no. There is no need for any new revelation. This is the word of God and this is all that we need. There is illumination, okay, and the Holy Spirit does illuminate us, helping us to understand what is within the context of his revelation to us. Uh, it's so... Um, having said that, let me read the statement, the post that was um, placed on the, uh, the, the uh, comment section. And it is from Inner Fire 89. Inner Fire 89 says, The perfect, in Corinthians here, 13, he says, The perfect... Paul goes on and says, We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 
Then he goes on and he says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So now keep in mind that this person is talking about maturity here. Interfaith 89. He points to that in verse 11. That natural maturity. That growth that comes from being in the word of God. And uh, he uses that to say that this perfect is another way of saying mature. When mature comes, when the mature comes, tongues will cease. If you continue reading, you'll see uh, that that is what Paul even talks about, maturity. Okay, so um, my response to you, brother, is this. Um, the Greek teleos is what is used here um, when Paul uses the word perfect. When the translators translated the Greek telios, telios can be translated mature, but the context always determines how a word can be translated. When a word, when they're not certain whether or not the word should be this or that, the context will always dictate what word should be used or how that word should be rendered in that specific language. Some languages, a word, a Greek word, which has four or five English, um, synonymous English meanings, can have one meaning, and only one meaning, in another language. So you have to understand that Greek being a picture language uh, paints a picture, a broad picture sometimes, sometimes a refined picture. But they paint pictures. The Hebrew and Greek were picture languages. So having said that, let me, let, let me take you to another passage of Scripture, and tell me, how would you translate that passage of Scripture in Matthew 5.48? How would you translate telios in Matthew 5.48? We're talking about perfect now. When the perfect is come, okay, that which is in part shall be done away. All right. Matthew 5.48, uh, Jesus, and of course Matthew, the, the writer of the gospel, used the word telios, same word, in Matthew 5, 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Do you translate that mature? You can't possibly translate that mature, because, and though some have tried, because they can't comprehend what the Bible is saying when it's calling us to perfection, knowing that we can't possibly be perfect in this flesh. Watch this. All right, the word perfect there is telios, and it is most certainly not talking about maturity, because if it is, then you're saying that God is immature. Because if you take the word perfect out, you see the writer saying, Be ye therefore as your Father which is in heaven. So, he's saying, Be like God. Is God mature? Come on, really? That's implying that God had to grow? That's a stretch. That's a stretch. You cannot possibly translate that word mature in that text. So let's look at another text, all right? And the Apostle Paul, um, again, over here in, uh, thank you, Jesus, in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul comes again and he says, Oh, let's see, okay, uh, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So we're talking about becoming like him now, right? All right. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, and of course we know that when our bodies are resurrected, they're going to be perfectly sinless, and like Christ, amen. But, watch this, we're not talking about just the body here. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, telios, okay. Not as though I had already attained or were already, either already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Why was Paul apprehended by Christ Jesus? Why are we apprehended or are called, drawn to Christ Jesus? Why are we brought out of the flesh, the captivity of the flesh, and brought captive to Christ. Why? Why? 
because we are called to be like Christ. We were created for the purpose of having a relationship with our Heavenly Father. That relationship was destroyed by Adam's sin, and that chasm that Adam's sin created between us and God was restored by the blood of Jesus Christ. The bridge was the the bridge was rebuilt, and we can now go to the Father. When that veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, it signified that we no longer needed a priest to go into the holiest of all, that we could go in ourselves. And so we now are sinlessly perfect in spirit. What is the message? The the being born again, genau in nothing, born from on high. When we're born from on high, we're born perfect. Jesus puts in a heaven-sent, perfect spirit into you and I as believers. That's why we can go and be with him for all eternity. That's why we can go and spend eternity with the Lord, because our spirit is now perfect. Remember, the scripture says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither can corruption inherit incorruption. But you see, when we're born again, he says, he says Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, what? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now watch what Paul says here in verse 15 of Philippians 3. He says, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, God's going to show you what I'm trying to say to you. He's going to show you what I'm trying to say to you. As many as be perfect, be thus minded. Remain that way. Understand that your perfection is in spirit. It's not in the flesh. The flesh will never be perfect. Paul clearly showed the difference between the spirit and the flesh and the contradiction between the two. So you can't take telios and make it say mature, especially in the text of Corinthians where Paul is clearly showing us that we um, have a gift and many gifts from God who are given to us by the Holy Spirit severally or separately as he wills, whomever the Holy Spirit wills to give, gives to, he gives to. He doesn't give them to all. He especially won't give them to those who don't believe in them. But if you believe, you'll receive. You'll receive. Um, I speak in tongues. I speak in another language. You would never hear me speak it out loud unless God gave me the interpretation or told me that there was someone else to interpret it. Because, the Bible says, to do everything decently and in order. So, I don't speak in the church unless there's an interpreter. And I pray between the Lord and I. It's private. My wife doesn't even hear me speak in these languages. And they're languages. They're dialectos. They're dialects. They're clearly uh, glossa or glossolalia dialects that are dialectos that are spoken with the glossa, the tongue. All right? So they're words. They're intelligent words. They're not some babbling thing that you hear Pentecostals um, constantly abusing that, 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 that teaching, that gift. They, they, they're, they've made the gift of tongues such an aberrant thing that nobody wants to have anything to do with it anymore. The Bible is clear in teaching. Paul went on at the end of chapter 14 and said, uh, you know, forbid not to speak with tongues. Let everything be done decently and in order. So, um, you know, I would never tell you, no, you, no, 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 tongues is not for today. Uh, uh, uh. You know, you're not gonna, if you speak in tongues in this church, you're out. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I am going to tell you that the Bible says that it is um, for today. The Bible tells us that it is uh, a gift, and the Holy Spirit determines who gets it. Got to come back to you. Going to finish up with this. Talk to you in a few minutes. In Jesus' name.